Let us continue in our study in Hebrews 11. I'm looking at a phrase that we draw from Hebrews 11, verse 6, which is, whoever would draw near to God. And that is a phrase that provides a lot of uh, context in Hebrews. But Hebrews 11, 6 said, Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and believe that he rewards those who seek him. And we have talked at length about these, this verse, I guess, the things that are in this verse. Uh, but I would like to grab this phrase about drawing near, drawing near to God, because that Hebrews 11, verse 6, is not the only place where Hebrews talks about drawing near to God. In fact, there are seven different places in Hebrews that talk about drawing near uh, using the same phrase. Uh, and this word, you know, for drawing near could be rendered in different ways, uh, could be come toward or come near, or approach. But it is, you know, the base of it is to come, and uh, it's put together with you know, towards. So coming towards God, or drawing near to God, approaching God is, is the idea. And this cannot be done in any sort of physical way, at this time, because God is spirit, and the kingdom is spiritual. Rather, what it means is our worship to him, our religion, if you will, that is our, our, our own individual faith in him that guides our own individual lives and choices in service to him, our religion in that sense. The, to drawing near God is maybe another way of saying worshiping God, but, well, yeah, approaching him, coming near to him somehow. It's about a general idea of how we live and how we serve him. We live with him in mind by, by faith. And that distinction should be drawn because in the law of Moses, of course, they had uh, a priesthood, they had offerings, they had altar and a tent of meeting, and later they even had a temple. So there was a place that you could come to or approach on earth. But that's not the case today in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> we're drawing near to God in a spiritual way, if we're doing so at all. So we get started looking at the places in Hebrews where this occurs, and it begins to draw a picture for us. So we start in Hebrews 4. The first place where drawing near to God is mentioned. He, leading up to our reading, which begins in the 14th verse of Hebrews 4. Leading up to this, though, he's been talking about the exodus of the children of Israel, how some of them fell and were not saved, but were destroyed in the wilderness, and how this was because they did not have faith, they did not stay the course. They did not hold fast to what had been promised to them and to what they had confessed when they walked out of Egypt across the Red Sea as on dry land. And he speaks of the Psalm of David many years later that says, today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. How he speaks there of a rest that we enter. We enter a rest and there remains today a rest for the children of God, as in that's still our promise today, is that we are perhaps sojourning 
as they were in the wilderness, we sojourn here in our lives and we are headed towards that rest. That's what leads up to the 14th verse of Hebrews 4. Down through the 16th, where we introduce a major theme in the book of Hebrews, which is endurance. In fact, it is the major theme of Hebrews. <laughs> this is the number one point of the entire book is endurance. But he said there in Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, the 14th verse made a point of saying, we must hold fast our confession. In view of our high priest, who is Christ, who has passed through the heavens, which is better than any earthly high priest, in view of these things, let us hold fast our confession. So again, this is endurance. We have already confessed. We are already Christians, but we must remain faithful. We must stay the course. We must endure And he followed that up by saying we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. That's not the kind of high priest that Jesus is. He can sympathize with our weaknesses in the sense, if you will, the very real sense, that he himself has been tempted as we are. Yet he did not sin as we have all given in to sin, but he never did. But he has been tempted as we are. He was tempted in all points as we are. He lived in the body and went through everything we went to, but or went through or go through in this world. But the point of this, the bigger point is that he is effective as a high priest. Uh, he is not distant from us. He is not such that he doesn't know what it's like to be in our shoes. And again, the 16th verse says plainly, we don't, uh, I'm sorry, 16 says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. And there's your draw near. Whoever would draw near to God. With confidence we draw near the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's about the effectiveness of Jesus as high priest. The confidence, the boldness that we gain in approaching God, which should be a frightening prospect, approaching God. The confidence that we have to do so, the boldness that we have to do so, is the effectiveness of the priesthood of Jesus. We can worship with confidence because we know that Jesus is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Our high priest who intercedes for us in heaven, not on earth and in some, you know, human nation that some man made altar at some temple made with hands, but no, in the heavens themselves before God is offering on our behalf. And this one was also in the flesh. He knows what we are going through. This is our confidence to draw near to the throne of grace. It is grace that allows us to draw near. I mean, it's, we need to understand it should be a frightening thing to draw near, to approach the holiest of holies, the Lord God Almighty. And the reason we can do so is because of Jesus. This is how we can worship. We can worship in this way because of him. So this is the first appearance of the idea of drawing near or worshiping. 
that we do so with confidence because we know we're going to receive mercy and we know we're going to find grace and help uh, to help in time of need because we know what kind of priest we have and wh- what he is doing in heaven. Second place where you find this idea of drawing near would be the seventh chapter of Hebrews, where we go now. And we begin to read in Hebrews 7, verse 21. But this is a place where we are drawing near to God by means of his chosen high priest, Jesus Christ. That priesthood, not only effective because he knows what it is to be like us, making him an effective mediator, opening, you know, I guess opening the door to mercy. But here in Hebrews 7, it's through his work as the priest that we are able to draw near to God. The priest that he is, is Hebrews 7.21, which is itself a quote from the Psalms. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. The former, uh, this makes Jesus guarantor of a better covenant, a better agreement, a better testament. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. But again, the promise to him is that he is a priest forever. And this is expanded upon in Hebrews at length, talking about Melchizedek and how we interpret what Genesis recorded for us about Melchizedek, as well as what Genesis did not record for us about Melchizedek, namely, without father or mother, without beginning and without end of days. That's how he is a priest forever. But this, the rest of the passage is also plain when it says, former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. Yes, death is pesky that way. You can't continue to serve as a priest when you are dead. You can't do anything at that point. And all of them did die. All of the Levit- Levitical priests died. Every, you know, so often another had to take the place of the one who passed. Aaron did not live forever. But Jesus does. He continues forever. And so he holds his priesthood permanently. There's not a need for another to come. There's not a need for a replacement. And the, you know, the outcome of this is recorded at verse 25 again, consequently. He's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. When we say to the uttermost, it means forever in any generation. All of us can worship the entire duration of our lives. And everybody who comes after us will also worship the entire duration of their lives as all of those who came before us worshiped the entire generation, the entire duration of their lives through this one and the same, Jesus Christ, the high priest. He is the one who saves everybody. He is the one who gathers up all generations for all time in himself. Everybody, whoever they are, who has drawn near to God since the time of Christ has done so through Christ himself. Those in the days of Moses who drew near to him did so through Aaron and through his sons and through their sons following and following and following 
But not so in the days of Jesus. Anybody now who has ever been righteous since the first century has been so by drawing to God, drawing near God through his high priest, Jesus, who always lives to make intercession for us. So we draw near by that high priest. He has the power to save and to keep saving, and he'll be around to save the next generation and the next after that one. And it's the same Lord, the same salvation, the same message, So we move to the next one, which happens in Hebrews chapter 10. Where we draw near. In full assurance of faith. But drawing near again is about this worship. It's about this religion. Our belief in God, our attempt, you know, to be reconciled to him, to offer thanks and praise to him, to continue in an agreement, a covenant with him. Hebrews 10 verse 1 captures. Since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of the realities of Christ, the law can never, by the same sacrifices offered continually every year, make perfect those who draw near. The law of Moses can never make perfect the people who draw near to God through it. Those who are worshiping according to the sacrifices under Moses and the sacrifices offered through the Levitical priesthood, sons of Aaron, can never be made perfect. Otherwise, wouldn't they have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. No, the law cannot make perfect those who draw near. On the contrary, at the 11th verse, He said, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But, continuing into the 12th verse, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time on until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, verse 14 says, By a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Yes, those priests were having to offer daily and repeatedly. And it's because they were never never able to take away sins. But Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. Himself, right? Right? And since that time, he has sat down at the right hand of God and is just waiting until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. There's no more offering. There's no more sacrificing Jesus or subjecting him to death. That's done. That one sacrifice is the one that saves everybody from now on forevermore. That's why he said what he did. By a single offering, he has perfected. The law couldn't do it with many offerings, but Christ can do it with a single offering. And that perfection is for all time, those who are being sanctified. So anywhere in time, any generation, whoever comes to him and is sanctified is being sanctified in this way, by this one offering. Which is why the 19th, through the 29th verses, can conclude in this way. Therefore, brothers, Hebrews 10, 19, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and 
since we have a great priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. All the more as you see the day drawing near. But again, we look at the 19th through the 25th verses. We do have a confidence, a boldness, to enter the holy places by means of the blood of Jesus. That's the offering that has been laid. This Jesus is the great high priest over the house of God, and he is our priest. Not only did he shed his blood for us, but also the 20th verse, he inaugurated a new and a living way through the curtain, which is to say in the in the original, in the law of Moses, in the tent, there was a curtain in front of the holiest of holies, the space where the name of the Lord was said to dwell. It protected worshipers from direct access to the Lord, from his wrath, and only the high priest could enter it, and only once a year, and only with the blood of an offering on the Day of Atonement. But we ourselves enter these holy places by the blood of Jesus. We ourselves have a great high priest in Christ who makes this possible for us to enter by means of his flesh, which is telling us something. You can begin to see here Up to this point, we've been talking about how good Jesus is at being a priest, how much better his priesthood is and his offering is and his longevity, how good God is to be gracious to us and forgive us. Here we first begin to intimate this idea because of his flesh, that we also draw near in the flesh. That's the beginnings of a lesson on obedience, you see. That's what's happening. Which is why he goes on to say, with this confidence, with this great priest, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and bodies washed with pure water. There's a full assurance that we have that comes through our faith in Him. Not in ourselves, but in Him. But we are able to do this once our hearts are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies are washed with pure water. We can talk about this at a little bit more length here in just a moment. But I hope that these things are clear to those who are mature in the faith, that you know how the heart is sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. You know what we mean by pure water that washes the body. But this is how we draw near to God. And therefore, the 23rd verse says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. The one who promised is faithful, so let's be faithful to him. Let's hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, which is still that theme that we talked about of endurance. And... 24, let us continue or let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. These things we are doing in sight or in view of the confidence we have through Jesus, both his blood and his flesh, 
the priesthood we have in Jesus, the sprinkling clean of our conscience, the washing of our body. You see how the spirit and the flesh are brought together in obedient faith to God, both in the Son of God, who opens this way to us into the holiest places, and also in our own lives as we come to him in simple trusting faith. And what we do with this is hold fast the confession of hope and consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. This is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's the religion of God, and it always has been. First, we hold fast our confession without wavering, and next, we consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. Well, finally, we'll go, we'll, we'll go to Hebrews 11. There are, if you've been keeping count, there are other references, but that's for the next lesson, which we'll do. <laughs> and Hebrews 11 is the last one we look at in, at this moment. And what I'm drawing attention to in the sixth verse, we didn't talk about earlier, but whoever would draw near must, you know, must, should be italicized, emboldened, however you want to call it. That's got to be the thing where the emphasis is. Because there's a threat. It's impossible to please him without belief. There's a threat that we can't please him. There's something incumbent upon us if we want to please him. We can't do it without this. Therefore, we must. Whoever would draw near... If you want to draw near to God, and you need to, if you want forgiveness of sins, if you want eternal life, you can't do it without belief, which is faith, but belief. For whoever would draw near to God must believe, first, that he exists, and second, that he rewards those who diligently seeks him, uh, that diligently seek him. But we must do this. We, we, you can see in the earliest references to drawing near that the focus was on what God has done and how good God is and how effective Christ is. And what has been accomplished, what came before in Moses and how it foreshadowed what the reality is in Christ today in the Spirit. But it's focused on what God has already done. You saw an inkling in chapter 10 of our obedience, implicit in the flesh of Christ, in looking for how to stir one another up to love and to good works. But Hebrews 11.6 is the first place in this letter that's formulated in a way that places requirements upon the worshiper. If you want to worship God, there are requirements for doing so. And these are they. You must believe first that he exists, but you also have to believe that he rewards those that seek him out. Persistence pays. Endurance is necessary. Wait for the reward. That's what he's talking about. All the examples in Hebrews 11 are of people who saw something coming, who held on and held out, not having received these things in their lifetimes, but knowing that in the life to come, God would make good on these promises. That's, the whole point of that is to tell us that we must also endure through our lifetime, and we also surely will inherit together with them. But yes, drawing near to God involves our own action. We're, we're required to do some things. Well, we mentioned Hebrews 10 earlier that 
we mentioned there that we would look again at the 22nd verse. And that's where we are now as we draw attention to your own salvation. You know, the big picture about endurance is for all of us who are children of God, who are Christians. And certainly, as we draw to the invitation, if you are a Christian and have not endured, repent. Go back to the first love. And let us pray for you, because we all need help. But Hebrews 10.22 has something in between the lines that is clear to a Christian, may not be clear to those of you who have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus, to those of you who have not been baptized in water in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 10.22 said, We draw near to God with a true heart, in the full assurance of faith, that is belief, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed pure or washed with pure water. The true heart that has a full assurance of faith draws near to God in this way. What way? The heart is sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. The body is washed with pure water. What is it? Well, it's baptism in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. If you refer out to 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, it tells you that water now saves you, which is not the removal of filth from the flesh, but rather an appeal to God for a good conscience. The power of baptism is not in the water. We're not washing some kind of dirt or stain off of our bodies. The pure water he's talking about is baptism in water, in the flesh, which we are required to do. If you think of that as a work, well, whatever. It's what God said to do. But the heart is being sprinkled clean, not by water. The heart is being sprinkled clean by the blood of Jesus when you submit yourself in simple trusting faith to him. Put to death the old person of sin with that promise to live for God from now on. As 1 Peter 4 goes on to explain, the time past is sufficient for having done the will of the nations. We should live the rest of the time in the flesh for God, who gave himself for us. So we draw near in a true heart and an assurance of faith with that confession that Jesus is the Son of God, with that confession that we have been wrong and God is right, with that uh, repentance of heart, with that uh, baptism in his name, because it is what he has commanded. Baptism now saves you, First Peter 3.20 and 21. And that's how you draw near. You're not near until you've done that. So again, are we speaking today and you are not a Christian? It's time to obey him. Put him on in baptism. We're glad to help you. We have water prepared. If you're a Christian and haven't lived right and need our prayers, we're glad to pray with you. Nobody's above temptation. Nobody's better than another. We're all co-equal in the kingdom of God. If we can help you and encourage you in the service of God to obey him for the first time or to come back to him, please let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.